So this is a streamlining distributed stream processing with Supercheap. Uh, I'm Ray, as Joe said, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I work at Librato uh, on the data team, uh, and we do uh, metrics as a service, or you might know us uh, for doing metrics as a service. Um, and you probably think of this sort of stuff uh, when, uh, if you have any familiarity with uh, Librato. But we also do uh, metrics and monitoring as a service because uh, we have threshold windowed and absent detection alerting for all the metrics that you send us, and it's a uh, it's pretty good, it's pretty robust. Um, in addition to that, we have integration uh, adapters for all the sort of services that you depend on, including uh, AWS and uh, services there, and Heroku as well. So we do metrics and monitoring is really metrics and cloud monitoring. <laughs> yeah. So that's the end of the sales pitch, though. Uh, that's uh, not what we came for. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about distributed stream processing and um, sort of what we've done in the evolution of that at Librato. Um, so just a little bit about um, <clears throat> numbers uh, to give you an idea of the sort of scale that we're, uh, we're dealing with at Librato. Some of you guys probably have more data, more machines. Uh, some of you guys might have less. But um, it's basically, it's about uh, around 15 terabytes a day, uh, and it can peak above that. Um, a couple, that translates to about a couple gigabits a second into the streaming tier. Uh, it's millions in, of messages a second. Um, and right now, uh, at the Super Chief, the streaming tier, it's about, I think it's about 21 instances um, today. That's doing all the processing. Uh, so a little bit about our uh, philosophy just as a team uh, and on the data team and, and really the whole company. Um, we favor composability and small components, well understood technologies and end-to-end -end visibility obviously because we're a monitoring company. It's important for us to uh, be able to see everything that's going on inside of uh, the streaming system and in the entire data infrastructure. Uh, so when we started, uh, it was pretty simple. Um, I'm not going to go into much about metrics because I assume you guys all know what metrics are as you're at the metrics meetup. But uh, basically, we, we collect metrics um, via the API and we get them into Cassandra uh, as quickly as possible. And that was kind of how we started. Um, that data, we, we refer to that as raw data, um, and it can have a one second granul uh, granularity. Uh, so uh, after we, we got that in, we decided we wanted to do time series aggregation. Uh, one minute, 15 minute, one hour, uh, and do uh, basic computations on that, min, max, sum, averages, counts. Uh, so the first thing we did is we did the easiest thing possible, which was basically batch-based processing for these aggregations. And um, it was a simple uh, Ruby job that would run on a cron, uh, and it actually works, works well, it works great. Um, and I, I think, I think it's a good step, and I think it's, it's often overlooked by a lot of people. A lot of people just sort of immediately reach for a distributed stream processing system. But um, doing it in a batch-based way is good. It's not distributed. Um, it's uh, easy to sort of verify the correctness of your aggregations. You can run it repeatedly, and it actually comes in handy later. So if you have any sort of failures at the streaming tier, uh, and you need to basically you know, rerun the aggregation, you can run it in a batch form, and you can use it for verification as you make changes to your stream processing system. So it works well until it doesn't, um, when basically processing time exceeds the aggregation window you're trying to do. So you can't do this um, quick enough. So Essentially, we, we, we had to look, at, uh, look for something to do continual uh, stream processing, and so we, we, we looked at Apache Storm, and we started implementing with Storm. So conceptually, the, the basic um, architecture that we had where it was just API and getting that data into Cassandra changed a bit. Um, so uh, we would receive that information, get it into Kafka, and then uh, send it to Storm for aggregation and processing. So at first, that was just basically three uh, storm topologies for time series. Um, and basically we made sure that those, the logic inside of uh, storm was idempotent. Um, so all the topologies uh, handled each measurement discreetly per metric and source. Uh, and we refer to those internally as roll-up topologies. Uh, so if you have 60 discrete uh, one-second measurements, those can be rolled up into a minute measurement, 15 
one minute uh, measurements can be a 15 minute aggregation and four of those roll up into an hour. So fancy. Uh, so that translated into three storm topologies. Uh, but well, it, what, we started with three, but it ended up being five because even though conceptually we're doing three, basically as we're growing, we started to shard the, the Cassandra ring. If you look at, uh, we had four rings basically. So we have raw data, we have one minute aggregations, 15 in one hour. Uh, and so the data on the left essentially is really like higher volume writes and the data on the right is, is sort of lower volume but has longer uh, retention time characteristics. So part of the problem though with Storm is that it essentially fails fast. So um, if you try to write to Storm and the queues are um, filled, basically it drops packets on the floor and then it will replay again. So if we have any sort of um, latency or issues at the Cassandra tier, what would happen is you'd have data coming in, raw data, trying to get aggregated into the 60 minute topology, or the 60 second topology, the one minute, uh, and then we're trying to write it to the, the one minute cluster in Cassandra, it starts failing and it starts backing up. And so essentially what will happen is everything backs up. So now your, your, your 15 minute aggregations are backed up, your one hour aggregations are backed up. So what we did was we split that out and we put Cassandra between, or we put uh, Kafka between the storm topologies, and that gave us the ability to have failures at one tier, uh, but continue to process. So that worked well for a while, and then we started to introduce new features. Uh, Server-side aggregation, uh, service-side aggregation, <laughs> so uh, non-discrete variable window aggregations. What that means is um, primarily a lot of people use this if they're on Heroku, they can't run StatsD, and so they'll, they'll have a service uh, and they'll want to do like a distributed counter. Uh, so they'll send us, they'll send us uh, inf uh, metrics from their instances and we'll roll them up for them. It also supports variable windows so you can specify uh, how long, uh, what the aggregation period is for that. And then um, alerting, so we added alerting and that was several other storm topologies uh, as well as uh, historical reporting or historical import of data. So you could import data from uh, a good bit in the past and in large chunks. So those five storm topologies became 12. Um, and it was, yeah, it got, it got pretty messy. Um, but that's, uh, and so, you know, we're a small team. It's just a couple data engineers. We weren't at 100 servers, but we were, we were on our way there. And uh, that was okay though, uh, you know, because with storm you can always just keep adding, you know, more servers. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So basically, we added a, a you know a lot more instances and started to scale out that tier. Um, over time, though, uh, so Storm was successful at Librato, and it definitely helped us um, basically focus on other really important features and not focus on all the complexity of building a distributed stream processing system. But um, over time, we started to r run into some issues with Storm. Um, and a lot of them are outlined in the, um, the Twitter Heron paper. Um, how many of you here are running Storm or, or something like that, like a, a, a open source framework for distributed stream processing? Okay. So, so yeah, so a lot of these issues are in this paper and it's definitely worth, worth a read. I'm gonna talk about specifically like Storm 091 through 094, because um, that was what I had the most experience with. Uh, some of the, some of the issues were relatively minor, like inconveniences, just having to write code in odd ways that you normally wouldn't if you were writing services on the JVM. Uh, other issues were uh, more serious. Uh, so if you had an issue on, a, on a, a node in a storm cluster and you might want to take a stack trace or a heap dump, um, there's a supervisor and there's a master node that the supervisor has to heartbeat to. And so when you actually go to do a stack trace or heap dump, that would cause the heartbeat to miss and the supervisor would kill your instance so the JVM's dead and you can't get a heap dump. Um, other things are like are more serious. So any unhandled exception actually kills the worker. When I say worker here, what I'm talking about is it, in storm uh, speak, that's essentially the JVM. So any unhandled exception in the processing pipeline would kill the worker. Uh, and that was bad. Um, but it was really bad in, uh, when this bug sort of came about. So this was a bug in Storm um, 
092 or 093. So uh, essentially any exception would kill the worker and that caused cascading failures to all the other workers. And so it would bring down your entire processing tier. Um, so, but the big reason why we sort of decided we needed to streamline what we were doing here and make this just easier to reason about was the inability to isolate debug and reason about uh, performance issues. Um, so the way we tried to accomplish that with Storm was essentially over-provisioning. Um, so, and, and this is common, and they talk about this in the, in the Heron paper. So to sort of understand, um, to sort of understand though, uh, you know, how you go about isolating this, it's probably best to kind of look at the way Storm works. So essentially everything in Storm is basically an abstraction. Uh, everything, like threads, there's no concept of threads, it, it calls you. Um, and so basically, uh, everything's abstracted. The two lowest abstractions are, are uh, spouts and bolts. And basically, it looks at your code as a directed uh, acyclic graph. Um, so the spouts and bolts, um, spouts basically allow you to retrieve data from some source, like Kafka, and transform it into a stream of messages. Bolts are an abstraction that allow you to perform computation on the stream. So you logically connect these things in code, and then you use a hashing algorithm, so as data comes into your, in storm parlance, they call it topology, it routes it to different instances uh, of bolts uh, if you need to retain state across your cluster. So now, in order to run the, bout, the, sp the spouts and bolts, you have another abstraction called tasks. And tasks are grouped together in an abstraction called executors. Now, executors are run by, by a few threads and are grouped together and run inside a JVM by another abstraction called a worker. You can have as many workers per server that you like. Uh, in order to get your code to the worker, there's a single point of failure. There's this thing, there's a Nimbus, and it's, a, it's called a Nimbus server. It's a master node. You bundle up your code, and you ship it to Nimbus, and then it deploys it to the cluster, which basically becomes like this full mesh of uh, like a HPC Dragonfly topology and your data skips along all the vertices and edges and it, no, it's not that bad But basically it's it's pretty bad, right? So it works it, it, but the thing is it actually works and it, it, it works great until it doesn't so some of the problems that you have are um, Disparate tasks run in executor so you don't have any ability to control where tasks land inside that cluster so uh, the and your tasks can be quite different. So you might have, you know, spouts that are reading from Kafka and other things that are computationally expensive. It slows down those threads because all that stuff is abstracted for you. Uh, the only thing you can do is tweak the number of tasks and or ship the topology and hope that you get a better shuffling. Uh, you know, so one thing we did just to deal with that is we rewrote the, the spout allocation logic. So we, we made sure that all the processes that we're going to read from Kafka were, for example, distributed evenly across the entire cluster just so we could, you know, make sure we didn't have odd late latency spikes and stuff. Um, so another thing you end up doing is you end up with one worker per instance. So basically you can't run, even though with Storm you can run multiple jobs, multiple topologies, you don't because you need to be able to isolate stuff. But ultimately it ends up being multiple hops from JVM to JVM and this sort of adds up. Um, each, each worker inside a storm basically has a global, um, has global queues and there's a single thread to receive stuff and then there's two threads that pass it to your code and then there's another queue on the way out and a single thread to handle that. So uh, basically you, you start running into a lot of queue contention as well too. But probably like the most telling thing is looking at this graph. So this is CPU utilization. Uh, with what they call tuple acknowledgement uh, enabled versus disabled on a storm topology. So what's going on here, um, this is two identical workloads dealing with identical data being uh, ingressed. So at first we started up uh, the, the, the long running lines are of course the, the one that's running with uh, tuple acknowledgement enabled. Um, the, the, the other lines below are basically CPU utilization. We're bringing the cluster up. Now we're actually shipping the code to the cluster, and you can see the CPU is about the same there. Uh, and then when we disabled uh, the tuple acknowledgement, which you need in Storm because it's, it's massively distributed and your data is bouncing all over the place, the CPU drops basically in uh, half when you disable it. So you're spending half of your time acknowledging messages as, as opposed to um, doing work. Um, 
And so, you know, the cogs is the thing. Um, we have to be aware of that. So uh, this is kind of obvious, but engineering involves trade-offs. It's part of your job. It's, it's part of what I get paid to do. And when I use a framework, it, it makes it hard to, to make those trade-offs. In fact, because I'm making a trade-off to not make trade-offs. Uh, and like I said, so it's obvious, but um, generally those trade-offs aren't advertised. What's advertised is all the, the great stuff you're going to get. And lots of times, you know, you're not going to need it. Um, so uh, the time to generally, <laughs> one of part of our philosophy is time to, you know, obviously introduce abstractions when you need them. So uh, this is my friend Colin complaining about working with, with Storm. So, uh, okay, so about how did we, so how did we approach a little bit more about how we approach kind of slimming this down and, um, in making this more sane. So Superchief, uh, that's our internal name for our new stream processing system that we wrote. With Storm, we were running about, like I said, it was about 45 instances. It could go up or, up or down depending on when customers scaled up, they'd send us more data. Um, with Superchief, we're running about half, it's less than half the number of instances, and the actual resource utilization on those devices is about uh, 3x reduction. So uh, it's a library. Um, it's uh, broken into two major parts, Super Chief Core. Uh, we use Drop Wizard because it's just a sensible base to start with for a JVM uh, service. It gives us configuration, metrics, logging, all that stuff. Um, we need to do clustering. So we have, you know, as part of our philosophy uh, of small composable parts, we have a library. This is um, open, this is available, anyone can use it, but it's just a basic service discovery library that wraps uh, Curator and works with Zookeeper. Um, this will probably be hard to see, but basically these are, our, this is just looking at a, a, a Zookeeper node and looking at the list of services that are available. And here you can see I have a Super Chief cluster called Super Chief R60, and those are the nodes. Um, so that's what one of the things that Super Chief Core gives you it's a library, you pull it in, you can start an instance and they register as a member of a cluster. So pretty simple. Um, then we needed to do work part partitioning and allocation. So the work I wanna do begins with, I wanna read from Kafka. So we know, I'm taking this from Jeff Hodges, uh, but I'm sure other people have said it as well too, that uh, the real trick to horizontal scalability is independence. So we wanna avoid any coordination between these nodes if possible. So we settled on um, a leader basically partitioning and writing, writing out the work allocation and pretty much nothing else. Um, in order to do that, we use Curator again and it's pretty small. Um, it's part of our commons library which is not available but there's no reason why we can't, we can't publish this and we probably will. So uh, we have a, a leadership task that allows you to, if you're a member of a, uh, if you're connected to Zookeeper, um, elect a leader. So this is a little screenshot of what that looks like. Uh, so now our conceptually, we have a super chief cluster here and we have a leader. Uh, so we use semantic partitioning in Kafka. So particularly we write the data to Kafka how we're gonna consume from it. And that gives us the ability to basically, um, if we need to keep any local state in the super chief, we do that by basically hashing the data that's coming in, determine what broker it's gonna land on and what partition it's gonna land on. So in this case, if I have a metric coming in, it hashes to partition two. If a Kafka node dies, um, the API just writes to partition two on, on the next Kafka node. And essentially that is consumed by an instance of Super Chief. So the partition times the brokers, how many brokers are in the cluster equals work unit. Um, this will probably be hard to see, but I want to have some code. This is essentially the, the leadership task. <laughs> I don't think you can see it, but this is the task that gets called. Um, that's probably better. That's the task that gets called when you get a leader elected. And it's pretty straightforward. It's got a simple method, just allocate. So allocate work, and it, it, and it writes a, a Kafka reader configuration. Um, and there's just a little bit more about you know, how that's done but it's, it, can, it does basically what I've explained uh, in the previous slides uh, conceptually. So the leader basically just writes out the config. These are the Kafka nodes you're gonna uh, read from. Um, and it kind of looks like that. It's probably easier, it's a bunch of JSON. Um, 
So how do the nodes, so how do, how do all the Super Chief cluster nodes discover or, or get that information? We have a library, it's a small library called WatchConf, and that is open. And there actually are, I think, a bunch of people using it now. Um, but basically it allows you to just have a simple object, a simple you know, Java POJO, um, and it handles you know, writing that config out to Zookeeper, deserializing it, and then setting the watches. It uses Curator again. Uh, so when, the, when we write out the config, it gets picked up by all the nodes in the cluster, and then essentially they all start reading from Kafka. Um, this is a screenshot of a Super Chief topology. This is the 15-minute aggregation topology, and it has a little UI as part of Super Chief Core, and I can see essentially all the brokers that I'm reading from. Um, I can see the topics, the last thing's read, how many messages are, have, are pending, um, uh, how many things have been retried, stuff like that. So inside what's going on, it's pretty simple. Uh, like I said, we want to keep it really simple and reusable. There is a Kafka reader class, and essentially that allocates a thread per partition topic, uh, broker topic and partition. And associated with each reader, there's a check pointer. Um, it tracks all the offsets that are pending if you want it to. You don't have to. Um, it does watermarking, so it retains like what's the lowest watermark that's currently resident in memory. When I say watermark, I mean Kafka offset, like where I am in Kafka, the lowest, as well as like the highest of the last thing that I've read. And it checkpoints all this sort of state to Zookeeper for you. Um, and then past that, the readers, basically, they just pass data to consumer threads. So you don't have to use this, but it's part of the library. By default, it's the number of processors, essentially minus one. And it's literally a Java um, consumer interface. We pass the data, just raw data, so it's, it's the, byte or the byte array <laughs> that you got from Kafka, and some meta information when it was read, so you can track late and see um, the broker it came from, the offset, things like that. So a little bit more, though, about the, some of the cool stuff that, that is built into Super Chief Core. Back pressure. So it's real back pressure. We don't have back pressure <laughs> with Storm. So the readers and the consumers, um, there's back pressure there. We have a queue. We can specify how large that is. And uh, this actually happened today. So if you have slow consumers, for whatever reason, uh, the readers will slow down reading from uh, Kafka. So today we actually had a node that was partitioned from the network twice, fell out of the cluster. And you can see, um, when it came back in, you can see the, the, the middle graph is the number of bytes that are pending. So this is bytes growing in Kafka because we're not consuming it. Um, when he came back, obviously the CPU spiked. The graph on the right hand side is essentially a metric of latency from the reader putting messages into the queue for the consumer. So we can see that he's got like several gig of data to work through, but he had to slow down, right? Because the consumer could not process it quick enough. But it recovers pretty quick and um, and yeah, and we have we have back pressure there. So it stops us from, from uh, overflowing our consumers. More back pressure, right? So um, that is not enough, essentially. Like, we also have a, we, and we borrowed this from Storm. There's a lot of good I ideas in Storm, and we, we took those and reused them. One of the things is max pending offsets, um, and so we, or max pending messages inside of Super Chief. Um, just doing it, throttling the reader and the consumer is not enough, because if the consumer is keeping up, you could eat too much, eat up too much memory and fall over. Um, that, that's particularly important when you fall behind because there's some sort of outage or a failure. You can't just read from Kafka because the way it works, I mean, Super Chief will read as fast. If you don't stop it, it will read as fast as it can. So what this does is allow us to say, only read this much and, uh, and wait until that data is published out the other side. Um, how you publish data out the other side, we, 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 we have offset tracking. Uh, message tracking and an, an acknowledgement, and that's tied right actually to the Kafka offset. So, um, so basically, you can also specify how long the message can be in memory, and this is actually really useful. Now, it's much more useful in the storm topology, in the sense of um, 
because it's, it's so much more distributed, but it has been useful in Superchief because we've introduced bugs like in the time series aggregation stuff, and it could be a very subtle bug, like a uh, race condition, and a message gets stomped. It gets stomped in memory somewhere. Uh, this picks it up. So if the message, uh, when a message leaves the topology, we acknowledge it. Um, if it doesn't, basically, we, f we, we track that it hasn't left the topology. We time it out, and we retry it. So looking at these charts here, actually this was an instance where we had some failures on the, the second chart on the right. I'm not supposed to point like that, point like this. Second chart on the right, basically, we had Kafka failures. That caused timeouts. So it caused failures of some messages. It caused timeouts on the far left, that little purple dot. And then those messages were replayed. So we retained a, a bunch of features from Storm when we when we built this, um, and it's been useful. Fail gracefully, um, so, if, uh, so if we lose Super Chief nodes, um, the partitioning logic for handing out work, um, you can specify a max number of work units, so if you had a 10-node you know, cluster and you're down to four, you don't want the remaining four to eat up all the work because <laughs> they could fall over, so we can be partially available like this. Um, so that's, that's most of Super Chief core, and then we have a Super Chief time series library. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I think I'm probably almost out of time. Um, but basically, we've, uh, we've abstracted the, the time series aggregation logic into something called an aggregator. And we have publishers um, and consumers of that. And so you can have arbitrary, the code's really reusable. So you can have arbitrary windows. You specify keys and what makes things unique, and it handles the discrete as well as variable aggregations for you. So you can select uh, what type you like. Um, OK, so basically, um, the, we, we still sort of have the same model because of we want to have, uh, you know, we want to basically break up our tiers so that we can do aggregation in, in the writing. But now it sort of looks more like this. So we have like super chief. Uh, R60, and then we, we write that data back out to Kafka, and then we publish it to uh, Cassandra. Um, so some new stuff. Um, there's actually more, than, more new stuff that I'm going to cover here, but just sort of some of the uses. Uh, so we ported all the stuff we had, with the exception of alerting, which is we're in the process of porting right now. So we're entirely off storm for all the time series aggregation, the writers. Basically, most of those 12 topologies, I think it's about nine. Um, and then we added new topologies. And so uh, one of the ones we added is for a new service that we wrote called Grod. And Grod is a, um, a service that's it's basically a uh, memory resident cache. And um, it's written in C++. And it's based off this paper from uh, Facebook uh, on Gorilla. And essentially, right today, we're serving all of our reads out of Grod. Uh, but it also gives us the ability to do write-back caching and compression on time series data. And we do that, um, we feed Grod with Superchief. Um, and it was easy for us to, to sort of stand that up and get that running uh, because it's a pretty simple library. So um, this is some uh, screenshots of Grod and Grod Writer, which is the Superchief uh, workload, basically, that's feeding Grod in production today. Um, and this is like overall latency. It's like two seconds from getting, that's getting data, uh, P99, from the API, doing all the validation, getting it into Kafka, getting it back out through soup. Is, I'm sorry, is it? Mike knows. No, this is, what's that? Two, this is full report time for the full pass. So in the into Kafka, and then back into Superchief, and then into Grod. So it's pretty cool. Um, OK, uh, and like I said, we have some other, we have some other um, stuff as well, but I'm not going to talk about it. If, if you're interested in some of the other use cases, um, I'll be around and uh, here to answer any questions. So thanks. <laughs>
And then they ask, should I get rid of X? <laughs> um, so SAMHSA so is actually pretty interesting. Uh, the biggest complaint that I heard and the one that um, we found was that yarn uh, primarily. And so the, I talked to a couple guys uh, that are doing SAMHSA and uh, they're doing like a JVM per partition with yarn right now. Um, and basically the same, and I didn't, I didn't uh, I, I just, this guy was just talking about it. It was me and Mike were talking to him. I didn't ask him. He volunteered. He's like, I'm having problems isolating, uh, <laughs> having problems isolating, debugging, and determining what's going on in the cluster. I, so in the future, though, I, what we're going to look at, we're probably going to look at Kafka Streams because it looks like it's kind of like SAMHSA without. Uh, and then there's some interesting stuff with Flink, um, basically with the uh, Chandry Lamport uh, algorithm. But... Any of this sort of, it's still a sort of micro-batching thing, so essentially you're taking that state and um, with, I think, Kafka Streams, they write it to a local DB, some like key value store like rocks or something, and then they asynchronously replicate it to Kafka. There's a trade-off between uh, the throughput and the, the time to do that stuff, so, but it's definitely something we're going to look at, yeah. If we add more partitions, so basically with Kafka, um, like partitions are a construct of concurrency as well. So I can add, so if I scale partitions, I can add more super chiefs. And so I've run this with many more partitions and many more super chiefs, and it performs fine. But if you had it on a box, like if you had many, many partitions and you don't have, and you're underpowered, you don't have enough cores to read, that would be a problem. So you might have to scale some of the, the boxes as well too, if it became a huge amount. Okay, thank you.